Well, thank you very much for coming, and uh, I first introduce myself. So I'm Zran from Samsung Research UK, and today in today's talk, I'd like to walk you through our practices and also our choices of technologies in building end-to-end -end, uh, IoT system with privacy in mind. So to start the talk, I'd like to present you a use case, and we're going to use this use case throughout the talk today. So what we're going to do is go behind the scenes of the use case and um, look at the technology challenges and our solutions. So first, we would like to look at uh, how to build IoT. Oh, okay, our use case basically is uh, uh, holiday homes in a holiday resort. I think uh, most of you have uh, you know, spent holidays and rent a home on a big holiday resort. So we're talking about this kind of scenario. So, to start with, our first step is how to build an IoT system for one single holiday homes. So in our case, we're basically using a lot, um, we use the Web of Things uh, technology, so we're going to touch Mozilla IoT platform, uh, progressive web application, and the web uh, Bluetooth. So once one IoT, uh, one, once, one, once, one, uh, once IoT is built for one holiday homes, we're going to go further, see how can we connect all these homes together? And uh, furthermore, can we introduce some intelligence when we build a holiday, uh, when we build a holiday, connect holiday homes together and build IoT for the whole holiday resort? So here, uh, and also we obviously main case is to respect users' uh, privacy. So here we're going to look at uh, federated learning and we're going to look at the architecture for the whole IoT system and share with you our current work status. So in a holiday homes scenario, I think at this moment only two main parties. One is holiday uh, makers. The other is uh, the owner of a holiday resort, or the, hol or the, the owner could be just uh, like another, another company, an uh, agent. So, so what should the holiday owners have in his mind when build uh, IOTs for their holiday resort? So first of all, I think um, one essential thing is uh, how the holiday homes are very smart. So easy access, easy control, and provide the best services. And then when you build this, it has to be, you know, have to be compliant with the legal requirement respect the user privacy. And the last but not the least, so uh, what is the uh, what's money side? What's the, is, it, is it a solution cost effective? And does it provide long-term benefit? And from holiday makers' point of view, um, I guess for us it's just a relax and easy access, easy control of the holiday utilities and uh, facilities, and also we want to be relaxed and not being watched. We don't want anyone to monitor how we use our uh, electricity, how many washes we do every day, you know, during holiday time. So let's look at how to build one IoT for one single holiday homes, and with privacy in mind. How is privacy doing in IoT? So how is IoT actually doing with privacy, really? So the concerns about risk that the Internet of Things has posed on data protection and the personal privacy has been raised for many years. And a survey from ICO in 2016 has stated that six in 10 Internet of Things devices do not properly tell customers how their personal information is being used. This is pretty worrying. The good news is that the government and also the uh, industry, they are taking actions. For example, in EU, uh, GDPR, I think everyone heard about GDPR here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, GDPR came in force in May last year. So this new uh, EU regulation basically is to protect personal data in law. And also, 
when you design and you know when you design and create new IoT solutions, we need to have a uh, data protection by design in mind, or previously known as privacy by design. So for web IoT developers, this legislation has a significant impact on how we think, how we deploy our technologies and what kind of service we are building. So we are actually thinking that uh, well, open web platform actually promises to enhance the privacy compared to other technology uh, stacks. So we think actually GDPR not only a challenge for web IoT, but also a very good opportunity. So we've been talking actually, you know, when we build our web of things for, uh, when we build, we build our IoT, we actually uh, mainly based on web of things technology. So what is web of things? Uh, web of things basically, let's, let's, call, let's just quote from uh, Wikipedia. It's the web of, is a software architecture styles and programming patterns that allow the real world object to talk to world wide web. So it's quite a top level. So, but when we look at uh, really, you know, what issues is address, let's look at this. So we, if you're an IoT developer, you know that one of the major concerns in IoT is interoperability. Because, you know, when we suddenly we have like a hardware, a software from different vendors and manufacturers, suddenly we want to connect them together. And they are not necessarily follow the same specifications, the same standard. They probably don't, not even talk to the same, same language. So how do you connect them, like, them together? So Web of Things actually basically address this issue by actually provide application layer solution. So regardless of the difference you know, in the network, network layer, physical, uh, physical layer. So bear in mind, this is application solution, So which means that um, which means actually it's only, it has to, you know, the things you talk, you would connect, has to talk web. So the scope actually, bear in mind, the, uh, the scope of IoT is a lot broader. Not everything in IoT, they necessarily connect to web. So we would like to think that uh, web of things actually is an uh, option for application layer solution uh, for, the, uh, for the traditional IoT protocol stack. So uh, the, the uh, Web of Things basically has been uh, specification work uh, led by uh, W3C, and uh, there are some implementation works uh, pioneered by Mozilla and uh, Google. I was actually, Samsung is also quite actively getting involved in this uh, implementation works as well, and the standardization works. So, so here we have actually a loosely coupled uh, uh, web of things solution for smart home. And uh, we actually talk about uh, uh, things gateway. So can I, things, things gateway down this way? So things gateway, basically you, you connect all your things together, manage them and connect to the cloud. And um, we talk about uh, control your things from your smart devices like mobile phone through progress web application, we talk about uh, to have a new device, new thing, onboarding, to connect, onboarding, connect to your network through uh, web Bluetooth. So now talk, look at this, uh, we just look at uh, each of these components in detail. So first is uh, the things gateway. So I guess uh, any of you t uh, attended the Mozilla Web of Things uh, workshop this morning. Yeah. So, this gentleman, what's, what's, what's your impression on the? It's good, is it? Yes. It's, a, it's actually quite an impressive uh, platform, and uh, it's open sourced. So, the uh, this morning actually the workshop I was there actually I think uh, it's mainly on talk about the gateway, connect gateway to things. But actually, the things uh, things project is more than that. It's a basic three parts. We have uh, uh, the cloud server here. Things cloud. Things cloud basically is a, is a distributed uh, co a collection of uh, cloud servers um, provided by Mozilla to connect the de uh, devices across the geographic uh, area. And we have uh, things framework. This things framework basically is a collection of reusable components 
to help you build your own web things, um, which directly exposed their web of things API. So they actually, Mozilla created this web of things API spec. We can't uh, document it, so do look up. That's what they're following. And this come to the things gateway. The things gateway is an um, uh, open source uh, implementation and which help to bridging existing IoT devices to the web. So inside the architecture, we can see that uh, uh, the back end of uh, the things gateway have uh, Node.js. So for, no, uh, for JS developers, this is good news. And then the Node.js actually connect, uh, Node.js back end talk to the front end through Web Things API, through HTTPS and the secure web socket. Apart from uh, J, uh, JS uh, um, support, uh, Web Things actually introduced another concept called adapter. This adapter actually is a language adapter. So it allows you to program your things using other languages like Rust, Python. Look at the security side. So basically, the web of uh, the Mozilla Things Gateway, they allow you, the, the Things Framework actually, they allow you to establish HTTPS where Mozilla uh, tunneling service. So also, it allows you consider uh, this is one way. So this is typical PKI public key infrastructure situation. So you actually you get uh, your uh, the, the key from your CA. CA actually is you get the CA actually is, is uh, less encrypted. So you start establish the TLS uh, tunnel from your gateway to your cloud server. And let's consider another situation. So if you actually not on site, you're off site. You are actually somewhere rem uh, remotely, and then you want to access your things at home. So in this case, actually Mozilla uh, provide this uh, back tunnel back-end tunnel from your cloud server to your gateway using paste cards. So on the other thing, this is the security side. And the other look at the authentication uh, authorization aspect, we, they actually follow your OAuth uh, 2.0. So the token, because you can choose a different types of token, the token they're using is a JSON Web token. Uh, what you want, I just wonder if you can show the yeah, diagram here. So this is actually a snapshot from one of our applications. So this shows that uh, this actually screen pop up on the things owner. So what happens is when the third party applications want to access your things, so the things here, it means like uh, uh, all the sensors in your home. So on the, at the owner's screen, we have this screen pop up. So you can grant the scope of the, uh, the, the access token. So like uh, I allow you to access a certain things, or I can actually further, you can check your um, uh, see, actually grant you read access, I can grant you read access. And the owner not only can do this, they can also delete and revoke these tokens. So this actually is a privacy, as so we can see, you know, you got to get my content if you and ask my, the scope of the things you want to ask me. And for progress web application, I'm sure there are PW experts down here. So we actually basically use PW uh, for mainly to in our mobile phone to control devices. So PW basically is a web, uh, website actually uh, deliver native app uh, look like uh, user experiences. They basically address uh, nat uh, nat uh, the issues in native mobile applications and the website and with new design concept and APIs. So the key features we have seen here, basically, you can have an add to screen prom promote. This is a basic native, a native application feature. And they can do offline feature, uh, offline functionality. So you, although the functionality is limited, you can, you can still show you, you know, what, uh, what already historical there, you can still control something. So this offline functionality actually for us is quite interesting because it's actually allow you to give us the possibility to minimize collecting, store, and using user data uh, as much as possible. Also, you actually know, give you possibility to know what data is reset in my device, what is up there. Um, so these features are basically achieved by you know, deploying a collection of uh, technologies such as uh, uh, service worker, app shell. So, but one thing is uh, we need to talk about another th aspect of security is uh, you can only serve your pages through HTTPS. So 
So we talk about having new device onboarding is Web Bluetooth. Web Bluetooth is basically based on uh, Bluetooth low energy. So the idea here is we use the Web Bluetooth APIs to discover, uh, pairing, and connect another Web Bluetooth device. After that, we once authentication finished, we actually pass the Wi-Fi information to the to the new device, and then along the new device connect to the network through Wi-Fi. So Web Bluetooth. Uh, uh, the reason we choose it is because the other thing is the web to serve, serves uh, via HTTPS. And the other thing is uh, if you want to start uh, Bluetooth in discovery, you have to do it through user gesture. So this is another aspect of uh, uh, privacy. So uh, we, we had, once we have one, uh, IoT build for one single uh, uh, holiday homes, they were thinking to how to connect them together. Connect them together actually is pretty, I mean, stand, stand, standard because uh, you get a cloud server, you actually build up cloud, uh, connect to your cloud server, which actually, in this case, uh, um, Mozilla Gateway actually already provided. When we look at the solution, we particularly look at uh, how scalable the solution is. How can, we, uh, can we extend uh, what we have in this uh, holiday result uh, use case. Can we extend it to smart city case, which has millions and millions of devices connected together? Scale, uh, scalability. And the other thing is, uh, we know data is very, very, very valuable. So how do we make a good use of user, user data? And then with respect of their privacy. So with this in mind, actually, we we want to use, make good of user data. We want to do statics, and we want to do predictions. So with this in mind, we basically choose um, federated learning. So I take a, all of you heard about federated learning? OK. So we actually made pretty much uh, using federated learning in this IoT solution. So what happens, uh, the federated learning basically is a collaborative machine learning without centralized training data. So the, 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 basically the concept was uh, initially proposed and uh, uh, termed by Google uh, in a Google paper uh, two years back. And uh, decentralized, we talk about decentralized because we mentioned about uh, without centralized training data which actually in this case is actually we talk about a clients and aggregate server. So each client have their own local training, trained model. And the privacy, we're going to talk more about privacy in the next slides. And uh, the last point is a possible personalized for a user. So basically if you can have your local trained model and there's, there's a possibility for you to personalize this model for particular users. So in IoT scenario, when we look, talk about privacy uh, measures uh, for client, link, and the server, we can talk about them together in conjunction. So the privacy features in, for federated learning, basically, uh, pretty much the uh, next three points, selective updates, and restricted role data updates. So you don't use, uh, you, don't, you try not to update, uh, get updates through raw data, rather you, got, you get through parameters. And uh, you process uh, local data as close as possible to the data resource. Let's, let's explain a bit more on this uh, in the architecture. So this is the architecture we have here to build uh, uh, the IoT for the whole holiday result. So things and between things and the IoT gateway, uh, Mozilla gateway is enough to do communication. So we are talking about uh, gate, uh, gateway or the hub in each holiday homes to connect with the cloud server, you know, the server in the clouds. And um, in this case, we call the, the client, the client is uh, the IoT gateway and the uh, Cloud server is an aggregate server in the term of uh, much, uh, federated learning. So what happens here is 
the learning model located in each gateway, in each client. And uh, once we, we actually need, we have the initial model in, so you have to base some here it's historical data and uh, train the model, initial model, and locate it. Uh, you actually locate them into each client, and they're probably the same for the cloud server. Once this is in, and uh, the local gateways start to train their models according to the data collected from their own house and update this model. So they keep on doing it. And what happens, the aggregate case server, when it needs update, is randomly select cert, uh, a certain number of uh, clients. So the, the, it's basically, it's not this time, next, uh, this time, this time, next time, we don't know, probably three of them in this time were selected, another seven from another group. So the, the updates, actually, the gateway send the updates via parameters. The raw data will stay inside the house. And then the cloud server basically, according to the updates collected, the cloud server, the aggregate server will update the model itself. Once updated, it will also update the client models. <coughs> so, oh, sorry. So with, with this King C man, we can actually quite, uh, it's actually, um, actually, it actually meet what our requirement. First, the data doesn't go out of your house. Raw data doesn't go out of your house. Second, the, ser the aggregate server still can, based on the model is trained in aggregate server, static prediction, create prediction or statics. So, our work on federal learning in IoT is still in progress. So at this moment, we set up the framework between client and the uh, server, and also we actually managed to get uh, uh, TensorFlow and the terrace running on Raspberry Pi 3. So um, this, this here, I'm just showing a simple example, actually, we run on the aggregate server side. We are, we are in the process actually doing like a, a utility usage in the house, but the model is not fully ready here. So this is the model we actually, we, when we try, test the framework, we actually create this simple model, just try to see how things work. So this model basically is to recognize handwriting, uh, handwriting digits. So what happens is uh, we show here basically the aggregate server uh, collect, uh, randomly collect uh, updates from three a selective, uh, randomly select three clients, and with the given parameters, it's actually updated the module. So what we cre create here is actually the uh, statics for the prediction accuracy. So if we show, actually I cut the, this uh, snapshot in shop is uh, on round nine or ten. So accuracy you can see in the top is 0.98. It's pretty good. So actually, we actually um, run the. We actually uh, had a hundred, hundred rounds, and the accuracy is pretty much on the 0 0.97, 0 0.98 uh, mark. So this progress is, in, is, is still in progress, as we said, and um, actually we are updating in pretty much every day. Uh, so if you're interested in this work, in our further work on this, um, do follow us. We actually have another talk in full stack in London in July. And my colleague, who is actually an AI engineer specializing in federated learning, will join me then, so we can discuss this part further on then. So that's pretty much my talk for today. Thank you very much.